let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody to the Pi Day version of the CDAR Risk Seminar. Uh, happy to have everyone here in person and online. And uh, I'm delighted to introduce my old friend. I have long have known each other a long time. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mariel Dion, who is uh, visiting from University of Grenoble, uh, just off the plane from Europe. So it's quite a Herculean effort giving a talk right away, but very excited to hear um, about portfolio optimization in an uncertain world. Mm -hmm. So Marielle has said, please feel free to interrupt with questions uh, throughout the presentation. So if you're online and have questions, just put them in the chat and we'll monitor that. Please yeah, that. okay. So I'm yeah. very excited to be here. I don't actually see the people who are online, so uh, um, I just assume them somewhere in the back of the room. Uh, welcome, and uh, um, just to say that I'm a professor in finance since two years now. Before that, I've been working in the investment industry uh, as a quant for uh, 25 years. Uh, very happy to be a professor now. Um, this is my the contents. So uh, what I want to do today is to point at uh, a flaw in modern portfolio theory, or I can also call it a uh, space for improvement, put it that way. So mean variance optimization is a good starting point, but can be improved on. And this is what I uh, would like to argue today. Um, when I say floors, space for improvement, I actually make a concrete proposal of how to improve. Uh, I'll make that clear. And then uh, I connect to many studies that do so do the same and I make the connection between these uh, studies which may be uh, interesting to share and I'm also going to connect to an article, new article of Lisa that I came across on LinkedIn. It is about um, eigenvector shrinkage. So I'm going to come back to that when I, uh, I've seen this just flying about on the LinkedIn and it caught my eye. Okay. Um, modern portfolio theory. I don't know if you're all in investment management that you are familiar with this or not. And from the audience um, online, I know even less. So just to go over the basics, it is the idea that Markovich introduced in 1952. Uh, a breakthrough to specify what investors investors try to achieve. He causes the utility function, which is indeed to maximize return and minimize risk, which seems sort of obvious today, but was actually a breakthrough back then. Um, and there is an hypothesis underlying this uh, model or this objective function, which is actually not <laughs> made explicit in textbooks, which is that the expected returns and the risk parameters are considered known with certainty. Just to get the text of uh, Harry Markovich itself, back on the screen, it is actually more subtle that, than that, what he said. He said, we assume that investor does and should act as if he had probability beliefs concerning these variables. That's a lot more subtle than we have made out of it since that we just take them for certain. So that is my focus. And I'm going to focus on the uncertainty around the risk parameters. There's a lot of text about uncertainty uh, um, around expected returns. This is not the topic today. So 
the covariance matrix that we uh, estimate is the focus. So I'm not the only person to speak about this. There has been a lot of debate ever since the 50s on this question. And this debate is sort of um, focusing on what is written out here. So the idea that Markovich optimization is vulnerable to estimation error. Anybody had been even close uh, to this debate uh, agrees with me that that is sort of the um, the uh, uh, reserves that are um, voiced about Markovich uh, optimization, that it is vulnerable to estimation error. That I don't exactly agree with, or that is not the best way to express the problem. What I say that it is the assertion of certainty that is at stake, that we take the covariance matrix as it is. I don't care if it is Gaussian, student distributed or anything, that's not the issue. It is that we um, define and specify uh, probability laws for asset price prices. So the assertion of uncertainty is an underlying problem that I wish to highlight. So now I'm going to try to make, well, make you travel if you like and to sort of make this um, more uh, concrete. So just imagine yourself uh, being an investor in the old Babylonian times. 4,000 years ago, trying to invest your money, money as good as you can, or uh, take a transport yourself in post-war Singapore, um, which is a, a very much a planned economy with an efficient governance. The, the difference I want to make apparent here is the uh, order the what I call what what is called the entropy, the order in the society, and to what extent uh, prices or e the economy as a whole is predictable, foreseeable. So that is maybe a difference between these two situations. Back in the old Babylon, you know, there was not even central banks to govern any, uh, uh, there was no monetary policy to govern the economy the economy or nothing, limited means of communication. So in that situation, you actually take different investment decisions. Here, in this order, you try to diversify, just put one over N, put your money in eggs as many baskets as you can. Can end of the story. Whereas in post war Singapore, you have the luxury, they, they call it, to actually count on some sort of form of uh, foreseeability and then to focus on minimizing price variance. And that is not the same optimization objective. Yeah. I know, yeah, I would like to. In the chat. Maybe we can... Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I'm not managing the chat at all. <laughs> okay. Would you like me to come off mute? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, um, question about Singapore because I'm familiar with Singapore's post-war history. It's, um, I mean, there were a lot of. Uh, it was it was split off from, forcibly split off from Malaysia. It was had a lot of terrorist threats. There were a number of um, perturbations economically that they had, the government had to plan for. There was a lot of uncertainty whether those planned economic initiatives would actually work. So I'm uh, my question is, is that what defines it historically, it's uncertain. I'm 
question, my question is, what defines it as a low entropy type of pricing environment? Yeah, no, indeed, a good question. This is only notionally to sort of give you an idea what I mean with low and high entropy. Having said that, today we are in a situation where that is changing. I think we are, it's fair to say that we are losing foreseeability with Brexit, with COVID, with the Ukrainian war. There are a lot of elements that make uh, us lose foreseeability. And so what you're saying, same for Singapore. So I was just trying to project Singapore post-war uh, with this uh, Asian version of the Marshall Plan, with everything was planned. And uh, indeed, all the all what came after what you're mentioning is indeed your right, lowering, uh, increasing entropy. You're right. Um, but what I want to get across is the idea of entropy. Does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah, we can we can debate the low entropy point there. So I get your point. Okay. Okay, and I'll perhaps rethink my example then. Okay, um, if I continue with this, um, no, it doesn't work anymore. My click once at the uh, at the, with the mouse uh, on the slides. Ah, yeah, okay, and then it goes on again. Yeah, yeah but now I've skipped. I ah, yeah. so just zoom back and put Singapore and Babylon in a in a longer perspective. And we, we go even left from Babylon, we come into utter darkness. We, we have we only know that assets exist. And the only thing we can do there is invest one over N. The probability distri distribution is uniform. It brings me. All price shocks are unforeseeable. And so the other extreme, and I would say it is as extreme is the world defined by Markowitz, so by the more modern portfolio theory, where prices are perfectly foreseeable. They all prices strictly obey to a predefined probability law. And in that situation, Markowitz is right. The optimal investment strategy is to minimize variance. Yes. So is, that, is it really true that in Markowitz uh, assumes a probability law or just attributes of a probability law? But that's indeed the subtlety that comes in and he rightly so introduced that subtlety. It was in a footnote that the, what was it again? The investor should, does, and should act as if he had probability beliefs. He does, well, he says, I, I, like you, I, I love studying that article. And maybe we can compare some notes later. But uh, the question, um, he, he says a lot of things, but what he actually does in his 1952 paper, the question is, what what does it rely on? Well, what he does in his paper is what people do since mean variance optimization right. and um, silently assuming the parameters certain. Yes, totally agree. But many distributions have means and variances, not just Gaussian ones. And it's my understanding that that's not needed for any of his conclusions. No, the fact that it's Gaussian is irrelevant. irrelevant. But it, the fact that we impose and we believe uh, a probability law to strictly hold. Okay. And uh, what he does, and what everybody does all day long, what I've been done for 25 years, is, is that. Yeah, seven years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yes. So, so that that I just want to put it sort of by the want to make evident how well, to show how extreme that is. 
Okay, so now, yeah, maybe this well, let me bother is here. No, uh, no, doesn't matter. Yeah, no, I have to get rid of there's just text uh, on the design because here it says directly what in mathematical terms what you should be doing. But it is possible to get rid of it. Oh no, it only says entropy. I could come later then. But this is already useful. Um, and now I have to click on the screen again. Yes, here we go. This is an investment example, well, a very basic investment example to choose the allocation between bonds and stocks. Um, and um, for anybody familiar with investing, is familiar with this very basic example. So I assume here equities to have a volatility of 15% and bonds of 5%. Here, I'm assuming zero correlation. So in this uh, setup, the minimum variance approach would lead to uh, an allocation of 10% equity and 90% bonds. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So that is you can do you can do it in an excel spreadsheet that what is what uh, minimum variance um, comes to if we are in utter darkness so we only know that ex bonds and equities exist what well, we do the 50 50 would be the optimum optimal investment strategy and if you agree with me, what we do in today is somewhere between these two extremes. I know very few allocations, bond equity allocations, uh, extreme as uh, the one on the right. It's usually something like 40, 60. And so that is in today's world indeed optimal, but we have no justification to actually get us there yet. So this is what I'm going to show. I'm thinking more often you have more in equity than in bonds, right? Yeah, I think I've got this exactly the wrong way around. Because I, I think I made a mistake here. Uh -huh. It's kind of equity, 10% bonds. Well, if yeah, you're realizing bonds. variance, that would be, it would be more bonds. Uh, okay, I just got it myself. Yeah, so wait that, that, I mean, there's a, the old 60-40, mm. hard to be. Uh, Kind of thing, but, uh, and 60-40 is, is indeed, and I can justify it, is the, an optimal strategy, but before we get there, we have to introduce an extra term. And indeed, the person on, on line, yes, I've forgotten that I was only minimizing variance, so you come to this optimum. Uh, in any event, it's extreme. Uh, what mean variance? You're assuming no correlation. Yeah, I'm sure oh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Okay, so here we already feel that we have already, and um, we are in this situation where we are a little um, at odds with our beliefs in market, with odds with market portfolio, uh, modern portfolio theory, sorry. So, okay, so my solution is to actually relax the hypothesis of certainty. What, how, where do we get if we do that? So in one extreme, in utter darkness, we would minimize, um, we would maximize diversification. And this is the way to get there. So just bear with me for a second. So you want to maximize diversification. On the other hand, with zero entropy, entropy, you would want to minimize variance. And since we are in a today's world, somewhere in the middle of these two extremes, I'm introducing an uh, extra parameter, which I call entropy, which is going to balance off these two investment strategies. 
you want to maximize diversification and minimize variance in some sort of balanced way, which depends on where you where you are situated. Okay, do are you on board for this? Okay, so actually we get to a uh, new efficient frontier of your life or a new trade-off to be made between on one axis the variance that you want to minimize and I introduce on the vertical axis the diversification objective and we are somewhere between um, zero low entrop entropy so we are between Markowitz world or after darkness where uh, we are in, um, in disorder and we are somewhere on the line that depends on where we are today. This isn't the usual efficient frontier, it's just quite no. a different picture, although it's clo close enough at a glance that maybe mm -hmm. you want to highlight the difference between the class this and the classical picture that everybody knows. Yeah, no, it is indeed what well, it is again a trade off between two things. So if it's the usual efficient frontier is trading off variance and return potential. And here, very much in the same way, you're in a situation where you want to trade off two objective functions. So that's why it looks similar. And this is just an artist impression, the, uh, the, uh, the line itself. And what's your specific me measure for diversification? Yeah, so at the moment, I've only taken this one. I'm going to tr introduce uh, two other ones. So that's like a Herfindahl index. Yeah, this is the Herfindahl yeah. index, yeah. That's her, so that it, it measures concent portfolio concentration. Totally. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, indeed, a good question. So um, you diversify if you lower your concentration in your portfolio. That's the premise. That's the premise. So all uh, one over n is just maximum diversified end of the story here that, that, that's that's my definition of diversification okay yes um i think you're going to the final people right so should i wait with my question because i was wondering is this here is this a personal preference between mm -hmm. the two or is it an objectively given measure of uncertainty or entropy so still so yeah prefer this rather than that or are you mm -hmm. are you assuming there is an objective way to generate them? No, indeed, uh, again, a very good question. And it uh, took me, I've thought about it a long time and struggling with this. And what my take on it is, is that there is a partially, it is completely objective that is outside of your will. So indeed, that uh, Brexit happens, uh, COVID happens, that then, we are in a world now that uh, makes us uh, get less foreseeability. So that is objective. That is pushing this entropy parameter on the scale towards uh, disorder. Um, but there's also a subjective element to it. And perhaps I can, we can come back to this later, but uh, indeed, if an investor is completely convinced or want to make a deal, want to make a bet, and is convinced, it also partly depends on the uh, of, of his conviction. And he, the investor no longer cares about having it right or wrong. Um, there is also a subjective element to it. Yeah. Okay. So you said that you maximize the justification and minimize the <laughs> You have a million dedicated in front of the 
diversification programs and then what is that mean and mm -hmm. that, and also uh, you introduce the data that is the entity is that the, the way that you put on minimizing the variance or like maximizing the diversification like let's say if it's 0 0.5 or 1 or like mm -hmm. that is kind of is that a way parameter or yeah and the two questions the first one is that i'm uh, been messing around a bit with my minus sign. At one point, I, I, I will tell you next slide, I really got it completely wrong. Uh, I may have it wrong, but the Herkendal index has a minus sign, if I'm not mistaken. The, the Herkendal index, so if you have n securities, right, it goes yeah. from 1 over n 1, and the most diversified is 1 over n. So that's, yeah. so maximum diversification is just written. Oh, it is correct. I okay. want to minimize that risk. Or equivalently, yeah. I mean, really, you can think of it as just variance if you happen to believe that the uh, covariance matrix was the identity. Yeah, that that will indeed will be exactly the um, one of the next slides where that we we come to the to exactly that. Yeah, it's great. Here, in fact, yeah. So this is expression is correct, and the weight. Uh, or the, the value of uh, theta is indeed uh, to be decided like risk aversion. It, it, it has to come up. It is an external parameter. Yeah. Okay. This is the setup of of the uh, of the approach. Okay. Um, yeah, I would like to go to the next slide, where indeed I introduce other specifications for diversification, which come from the literature. So the Herkendall index is also called the Rao, Rao squared entropy measure. It's two, one measure has two names. There's also the Shannon measure from information theory, which is this one. Um, and you can see that it is very close. And indeed, if you maximize this, you come to one over n at, at the end. So it comes, it comes to the same place. And then the third one introduced more recently is that you can even get rid of the first x only that expression, and here I mistake no sign. So this has to be a plus, sorry. Uh, that also comes to the same place and you will end up with one over N if you maximize this. And what I find in fact astonishing is having worked in the, in the investment industry, there is no commonly shared definition of diversification. We, we talk about diversifying uh, portfolios all the time, but there's no commonly shared uh, use parameter uh, measure to, to actually quantify that. So I, I wonder if you're, um, I think we've talked about a lot over the years, Paula, right? That I'm familiar with the work of Homer and she, 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 I don't know how to pronounce the name correctly. Uh, and the general uh, area is called convex risk measures. Okay. And they have a beautiful book. And I think one of the reasons maybe why we see what you see is that there's not a sound bite. I, I mm -hmm. think there is a concept of a pretty good theory of diversification and mm -hmm. a concept of what it means to lower it, but it is not something that you can say in one second. Mm -hmm. And their framing of it is quite mathematical okay. because that you introduce a concept of a Convex risk measure, which would be expected shortfall or additional expected drawdown, okay. or some other thing has to be convex weights. And then lowering that uh, is what it is means more diversified. So here, um, all, all these kinds of things are, are aspects of that. But so that's going from the, the very mathematical, the most mathematical one I know. But if I go into BlackRock and ask, uh, strategists what they mean by diversified they say close as possible with cap weighted benchmarks yeah oh yeah that's what that's like and and that's also a very good mm -hmm. 
concept. Mm. So I, I, I just, I, I admire kind of the multiplicity of, of viewpoints on it. And, and mm -hmm. also I hope with where you're going to bring in an element of um, how confident we are in our parameters to, yeah. to help uh, to help the discussion along. No, indeed, it is. Uh, in fact, I was shocked myself that me myself have been working for years and years in the industry without even being struck by the idea that diversification is not quantified in a, in a commonly shared way. It, it has many faces. Yes, uh, and I think majority of people working in industry are oblivious to that, even the, the question that there is. So here's here's just to, to add some thoughts to this. Um, we often get questions like, okay, you say I should track this index, because index tracking, of course, is hugely popular investment strategy and has been growing since 2008. It's going on two decades. And clients will show up and say, why should I track that index? Because it's so concentrated. Yeah. And that would score low on your Herkendall index. Mm. It would be closer to one. In fact, if you look at the Herkendall index, the S&P 500, I think it's around 87. Yeah, no, it's, it's not 500 at all, is it? <laughs> oh, sorry. Why it, why it's one over, one over 87 and not one over 500. A, a thing that's good to do with the Herkendall index is to take one over it. The mm. number of securities. It, yeah. So there are 87, effectively 87 securities and yet 100 mm. can be taken account of how concentrated it is. And when um, in, in the debate of active versus passive strategies, these concentrations and diversification that I'm talking about are quite um, quite useful. Yeah. No, and I think these questions are increasingly raised today because I'm pretty convinced that we have been in a blissfully world, blissful world where we had foreseeability and that uh, concentrated benchmarks were good enough for the job. But now, since we are, I think, going to more disorder, that question comes up, is that accurate for a benchmark? Is that uh, a good benchmark for us Today is, I think, uh, a valid question. Today. Yeah, I, I have a question. A few slides back, you had a, a new type of efficient frontier, which is on the lines. Of, yeah, and one over n high entropy. So that's this Herfindahl index uh, discussion we're having, where diversification is measured by dollars allocated. You know. Uh, then the green dot you have there, one over risk contribution, that's what really piqued my interest. Now, that is, uh, 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 how do you measure risk there? Mm -hmm. So with, with yeah. the one over N, we're talking equal contribution of dollars to equal weighted portfolio. One over risk contribution, we're talking equal risk contribution, but how do you measure risk there? Yeah, no, this is indeed... Uh, good to have picked it up. It, that will make more sense when I come to the slide where I talk about risk parity, which is in one of the uh, strategies, and it will make more sense there. Uh, if you if you bear with me, uh, we, we'll come to that. I'll uh, come to that question then. Merci. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so here are um, other thoughts and uh, solutions to the problem that I identified. So the uh, assertion, assertion of certainty, which is at stake, uh, five of them, and this is a non-exhaustive list, and I want to go through them one by one and actually make the link with what I'm saying. Covariance shrinkage. People are familiar with this uh, investment strategy introduced by Ledois and Wolf in 2003. I see some people saying yes, so that is good. Um, let's go into that. 
then indeed risk parity that I've just mentioned, then Bayesian optimization introduced by Steve Brown, or introduced into the investment world by Steve Brown uh, in the 70s. Then there's entropy based optimization, not very known. And more popular today, portfolio regularization, which is sort of in the wake of machine learning. We hear about this today a lot. So come back to them also. So let's go through the whole list. Um, the easiest one just to show the link with what I'm saying is covariance shrinkage, which is the objective function is here specified on the right. So we are going to optimize the portfolio, not with the estimated covariance metrics, but one that is shrunk. Shrunk means that we put more importance on the diagonal and less on the off diagonal. So that means that we are having more confidence in variance estimates than in covariance estimates. That is what it boils down to. Uh, this is uh, very known um, covariance shrinkage. And I think rightly so because it makes an awful lot of sense. And you can see here the, it is exactly what I'm saying, what you were saying with the identity matrix, um, which comes into the Herfindahl index. That's indeed equivalent. What the Duan Wolf say is equivalent to what I'm saying. Um, what else do I want to say here? Yes, so this article that I came across, if I'm not mistaken, is talking about icon vector shrinkage. And maybe we can discuss the topic at a later stage. But to me, that makes an awful lot of sense. And I would even say it would even make more sense than covariance shrinkage, because what is happening there, if I understand well, is that by shrinking, we're going to put more and more confidence on the most significant eigenvectors and going away from the less significant eigenvectors. If I've understood this well, it is in fact more, well, more justified and less ad hoc as the covariance shrinkage proposal. Well, it's a little like regression to a mean, which is the known since the 1800s, right? If you have a sequence of estimated things, biggest estimates are big for two reasons, because they're estimating something big and they have a, an mm -hmm. error that's big. You don't know which part of the estimate is signal and which is noise. Mm -hmm. And the bottom of the list has a similar flavor with the opposite sign. And so you might think, well, on average, I don't really know where the errors are. Mm -hmm. You're talking about errors, right? the person. I don't really know where the errors are, but it seems like the biggest things may tend to have the largest errors and the smallest things may tend to have the largest magnitude negative errors. So by shrinking it in, in some averaging way, you can mitigate this. Mm -hmm. So that it is goes back to Dalton. That's the idea of regression to the mean. And then you see it again in the 1950s for collections of averages with James Stein estimators. Mm -hmm. And then you can see it now um, with new research in estimating in ID vectors uh, when you're estimating a lot of variables, not so many observations, but mm -hmm. often are in So that is the historical regression of those ideas. And it, it does make a lot of sense. Yes, uh, indeed. It's it just have some intuition from what you say, indeed. And to pick up that you want to shrink towards the highest signal to error with a signal to noise ratio. Exactly. That, it, it, yes. And it, uh, these things are amazingly effective in ways that you can be very precise about all these shrinkages. And indeed, with the idea that you want to balance out uh, 
diversification yeah. and variance. Um, it, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> it is, um, I'm trying to get the, the R across. <laughs> Um, okay, so indeed, this is one way to see what I've just been mentioning, which already exists, and this is uh, just a link towards the more underlying ideas have never been made. Okay, if we go on, we come to risk parity now. So that is the idea to invest in a portfolio such that each asset contribute equally to the total portfolio risk. So indeed, and to, to say it schematically, the weight is one over risk contribution. What was just uh, mentioned earlier. Um, here I give a mathematical proof that that is indeed the, an optimal strategy if you, on the premise that you want to minimize risk, maximize diversification. In order to get there, you have to replace the Herfindahl index by uh, this uh, specification for diversification, which was introduced by Roncalli. And then you get there. So if you indeed want to minimize this function, we put the first derivative to zero. Um, and here about that, we get uh, the derivative of ln x is one over x. So you see in that that you get to exactly where you want to get, um, where each asset x contributes equally in terms of risk to the portfolio. The risk parity makes an awful lot of sense to me. There is Edward Kian has written a whole book about uh, risk parity and giving the intuition of why that makes sense. He has not put this sort of mathematical proof in his book. Um, it would just confirm his intuition to say, yes, indeed, that is uh, an optimum way of handling foreseeable and unforeseeable price shocks. So I hope to convince you in that. Yeah, has the character that is downweight high risk securities and upweight low risk securities. So if we do this in a very simple thing with stocks and bonds, yeah. you won't find you won't find ninety stocks and no and bonds you find you find a very different allocation that's much more bond heavy. So one, right. one, one practical thing. So this is, I love this formula, it's beautiful. But one practical thing to keep in mind about that is that interest rates start to matter a great deal uh, in in the bond formulation, which is also to your point about the world being so uncertain. We've mm -hmm. quite a revolution in interest rates in the past months. No, indeed, for this talk, I'm only concentrating on the risk profile and not at all on the return profile, which is completely schematic and we cannot ignore, indeed, the return potential or the potential disaster on the return side. That is indeed uh, adds to that. Um, and we can, with this framework, add with the return dimension on it. And... Um, come to you know very sensible portfolios in the end. Um, the question that came from online, sorry, is it uh, did I answer? This, this, this is it so close. You know, it's still when we say risk, we tend to fall back on standard deviation variance, covariance, uh, which you know, risk could be measured with other ways, the valued risk, you know, uh, condition of valued risk, expected shortfall. Uh, so when we're saying each asset has equal risk contribution, uh, is, has there been any work on risk being defined other than the standard covariance, right? What about? Uh, okay. 
No, I'm staying in a completely linear setting, mean variance and uh, no higher moments. Indeed, you're you're right. To, you're right. This is indeed already in this schema, uh, in this simplified view on the world. I'm already trying to be, be, get more precise. Yeah, that is an, an, yet another dimension to go. Yeah, but there there is work on that. It's much less paid attention to because those other risk measures can't be estimated as precisely as as variants. I think everyone would love to do this tail risk and you could write down a mathematical framework for it, but then if you want to estimate stuff like expected shortfall, which it works very well in theory, you're having much more uncertainty around your estimates. Yeah, in, indeed. Yeah, the third moment and the fourth moment even worse. The, this signal to, to noise ratio is just yeah. all over the place. So, yeah, the, the, yeah that is the. True. So, even there. with that, even with that, how about a fusion of risk parity with risk being measured by the shrunken estimates from your previous slide? Equal contribution uh -huh. of those shrunken risk measures. Yes, yeah, so that is sort of to combine two views and to um, what you suggest. I try just to stay on sort of the what your vision is and what consequences that has. Um, yeah, I have no answer to what, what you're suggesting, but it's a good, good to think about it. Merci. Um, yeah, I try to go to the next one because there we remember there were five uh philosophies that I want to connect. Oh there was a question. Yeah, Sorry. Just my question. Uh yeah maybe I have this but why do we have um uh okay so yeah here is again the minus sign missing. That's why. And then, yes, yes. yeah, my mistake. I, I, I'm very messy about my mistakes. Okay. So the third one is the Bayesian approach. You must be familiar just with Bayesian estimation itself. And Bayesian approach in finance is the idea to build a portfolio such that you take into account estimation error. So you start with a, a prior and a prior and posterior, and somehow you would like to minimize estimation error. So I, I've actually taken a sentence of Steve Brown from his um, seminal article which expresses that. So I read it. So the covariance matrix is estimated such that the loss is minimized due to suboptimality that would arise if the estimates turn out to be wrong. That's in fact the spirit of Bayesian estimation, and it's uh, quite a sentence you have to work the right way around. Um, I've already in the past called this psychodeck. To it's absolutely a sensible strategy, but I say in a psychedelic mindset. So you're going out to build a portfolio that optimizes based on your estimates, already preempting that you're going to be wrong and taking it into account in your acts. So I think you get to the same place, but um, I think you would just be better off taking all that loop out and admit that uh, uh, Risk estimates are risk parameters are not certain, and you would you would do end up doing the same. 
So anyway, that is Bayesian estimation that uh, Steve Brown introduced and uh, got picked up by Jorion, who's quite uh, vocal about this uh, approach, which is uh, absolutely fine, but it is, I think, just uh, a step too far to, 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 to adhere to that. I don't know, that's my um, idea about it. But do you get the idea that this is the same thing that we are doing? It, it comes and we you use prior uniform and you keep introducing the posterior, you are in fact uh, balancing out maximum diversification. That's what we do with a you know world with the uniform distributions and uh, Gaussian. You would be doing exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so let's go to number four. Well, yeah, that is entropy-based optimization, which is sort of a, a niche uh, in the literature, but I came across it. And what they suggest, so this is Kulbach, Leitner, oh no, it is people, yeah, Vera and Park do this, and they make use of uh, what they call the Kulbach and Leitner measure. And I just, don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but again, it is exactly the same philosophy that is uh, going on here. Okay. Maybe I just leave that slide for what it is and come back to um, a philosophy that is very popular today. So portfolio regularization, uh, where uh, so lasso rich regression or also called elastic net so we are going to minimize the risk of a portfolio and introduce an auxiliary term that regulates in fact portfolio concentration so are you familiar with the term portfolio regularization or lasso regressions or and that's you know that's, that's exactly my the formula I came I put on the screen coming from another angle, and so uh, not a lot to add to that. What I only want to say that all these five uh, approaches that I've come up with the screen do not mention each other's existence. Nobody ever makes a link that portfolio regularization is exactly the same as shrinkage and that all comes to the same place so the literature is fragmented and um, it shouldn't be and it do, you know, do you know a paper net by Jack Nathan and Mark? I've, I've seen I've come across the names together ah they, they do the covariance matrix and often is is the same thing as trying to estimation Ah, ah, I came across it, so yeah, I'm going to read that one. Yeah, okay, thank you. One of my favorites. I like, indeed, I like this kind of articles that are sort of coming out of their silos. Okay. Yes, it does. Look matter. around. <laughs> um, apart from the five I mentioned, they are sort of others i put on the list five other approaches sort of more or less ad hoc who are also uh, coming to the same place you know uh, robust optimization of course has the same premise of wanting to be robust with respect to uh, estimation error if you want to call it that way the resampling of michaud uh, who has been quite vocal about his uh, fantastic um, investment philosophy. Uh, it's all the same thing. So I just put them on the screen. That, uh, uh, what else did I want to say? Yeah, I don't know. We, we can decide. So I've got the basic message across what I want to say. Yeah, I've got some afterthoughts, if you like, to. Uh, uh, complete my story. So there is also uh, 
two French guys who are very vocal about their um, philosophy, which is uh, they've introduced diversification ratio, which you see on the screen. And uh, I'm pretty convinced that that is uh, the way forward for the investment industry. Okay, it is indeed has a lot of this overlap with what I've just been saying that uh, there is something to worry about, about diversification versus uh, price variance. They actually have make a ratio out of it. So on the in the denominator is the portfolio uh, risk volatility. So here is the idea of minimizing price variance. And in the denominator, they put a term like this, the sum of asset uh, volatilities. And indeed, if you optimize this ratio, you come to portfolios that are um, better diversified than the mean variance portfolio would, would, would get you. Uh, but I have just a reservation about using uh, risk estimate as part of a specification of uh, entropy or of diversification. So what I think is weak here is that the moment they are indeed a lot of unforeseen price shocks, so that today's asset prices don't behave in the way you had anticipated, at that very moment, your protection that you have sought with your diversification ratio goes to pot. But in the same moment that you need diversification is the moment when you have badly um, estimated it. Maybe not very relevant, but I just wanted to make a reserve, uh, re reserve about this uh, strategy, if you like. Okay, what else? Oh yeah, just to come back to our investment example and risk parity, if you own, yeah, gets you at uh, 2575, that's already uh, closer to what we intuitively would like to, to get. So that shows you that. Uh, yeah, and this is the question that indeed uh, you were saying about objectivity and subjectivity. There is, uh, um, I think I've already mentioned this. So there is uh, an outstanding question of how actually to balance off these things. And that is not an easy question. Uh, no, I just, not, okay. Ah. I think that's what I wanted to show today. And um, are there any questions yet? Yeah, okay. It's really nice that you brought it up. Can you talk about how to either mathematically formulate it or observe the estimation? So this is sort of the second order of that answer. Right? Mm -hmm. So the variance of variance or I don't know, the degree of order in the economy, if we can use yeah. something like proxies for the uncertainty level in the economy. I have thought about it. What well, I've done one experience, experience, in fact, for my Barra days, I remember that we were backing out the risk aversion level from a portfolio. You remember? So I've worked for and that was one of the first things I learned. So there is an investment portfolio and you can reverse engineer and just get the number out of what your risk aversion parameter would be to, to get you there. Uh, and you get a number. And I remember this number went into the Barra software. I remember well, no, but it's a long time ago. But anyway, so I sort of tried to do the same uh reverse engineer from what did I take? I think I took a risk parity portfolio and just got out a number for um, theta. But I don't know what the number was, but I have nothing to, to do about it. 
imagine it was 2015. So, and then what? <laughs> there, there's no intuition, there's no intuitive scale at all. And uh, yeah, so that is uh, uh, not an easy question at all. I think in relative terms, I think a lot of people would agree that uh, investing today, there'd be more uncertainty today than there was in the 80s, 90s. When economies were zooming along and uh, there are less so now. I think people will agree on that, but then to say by how much, if, uh, I'm at a loss to uh, Go back just because that it's easier to get. So we get, are we here? Yeah. So yeah, we are here. Yeah. Looks like this is the same thing. Yes. And but the open outstanding question, I think it's the same outstanding question when you do program shrinkage. Shrink by how much? Wow. Going back to the James Stein discussion we had a few minutes ago, there are theoretical frameworks that will answer that question. Okay. In some context. Uh, okay. And inevitably relying on some assumptions, which are to greater or lesser extent satisfied with data, but it does give there's plenty of guidance mm -hmm. on that in shrinkage literature. In machine learning, it's more ad hoc, right? People get it by cross validation. And what's been interesting to me in experimenting with these things is that in cases where there is a dedicated good thing to do. Not surprisingly, you discover the cross validation of machine learning. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. I keep getting this consistent parameter, but there's actually a theory that says that you have to have that. Okay. So that we can talk about that. I don't know about that setback, but there is there is guidance on those numbers. And I, I do love the interpretation of mm -hmm. which is a little bit different than your framework. Um, of, of it being the, the, the amount of uncertainty that you have around your no, indeed, and uh, all machine learning somehow, if machine learning is uh, mobilized for, for this idea of portfolio optimization, the question arises, indeed, in the, the same question arises, and how much can a machine learn from uh, imperfect or from, from mistakes, or not mistakes? How much can a machine learn looking at a system which uh, it doesn't obey to laws, strictly obey to laws? It is, we are not in utter darkness. So it, there is some structure, but to a certain extent. So I dislike machine learning uh, studies where they skip the whole idea and they people think that as soon as a machine looks at the stock exchange long enough the ship machine will end up knowing that is uh, for me a miss uh, uh, perception so the machine can learn to a certain extent what extent well that's that number that, that parameter there but uh, uh, still have to think about getting that more concrete. Yeah, what about the presence of machines operating, more machines operating in the market impacting prices? Yeah, if, if we are all replaced by machines and the robots are indeed uh, controlling the stock exchange, in that situation, you can actually have a uh, Prices being completely foreseeable, yeah. As as long as the machines are foreseeable, 
the prices will be as well, yeah. But uh, it's not machines controlling the stock exchanges here. Is, is that what you tried to say? Well, I was saying what you know, the impact of having more and more machines, not necessarily 100% machines, mm. but just the, the presence of machines driving some investors or hedge funds or whatever decisions, that's got to impact the, the whole system as well. So I don't know how, mm. how effective is the learning in that context. No, no, you're right. If indeed the actors on the markets are getting more predictable, eventually the prices as an outcome will become more predictable indeed. But uh, I think there is on a global, on a more fundamental scale, uh, uncertainties, you know, already in the fundamentals of pricing that are uh, countering that. Because even machines will have to think about uh, getting their price as market price is close to the fundamental value, fundamental values. Well, interesting question. Do, do we have any any more questions in, in the room or over the web? Wow! Thank our speaker. <laughs> for a super thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, for this time next week, we will be having again a hybrid seminar uh, led by a visitor from Europe, um, Leo Chan from the University of St. Gallen will be talking about green finance and top income inequality. So please join us. I hope to see and hear many of you then. And in the interim, have a great week. Marielle. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Bye bye. Bye. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Je vous en prie. Yeah.